Great, thank you everyone. Good evening and welcome to Hackney Council's planning subcommittee meeting. My name is Councillor Steve Race and I'll be chairing this evening's meeting. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and it's been live streamed on YouTube and councillors taking part in voting this evening are present here in the chamber. If any committee members are accessing this meeting remotely, they're reminded that they're not counted as being present for purposes of the Local Government Act 1972, and they may not vote on any items under consideration. At my discretion, they may, however, contribute to the discussion and participate in a non-decision-making capacity. Welcome to members of the public and the press who join us this evening to participate in or to observe this meeting. And for anyone joining the meeting remotely via Google Meet, there's a chat function. However, please only use this to raise IT-related issues. As chair of the subcommittee, I won't be monitoring any comments made in it. Meeting participants, remind us to turn their mobile phones off, please, or put them on silent. And please note that any persistent disruptive behavior will result in you being asked to leave the meeting. In the event of an internet outage, we'll adjourn the meeting and then come back and continue once that's resolved. Uh, firstly, I will turn to my fellow planning subcommittee members and ask them to please introduce themselves uh, one by one. We'll start front left, which is Councillor Narcross from for me. Um, Councillor Narcross. Hello, Sarah Young. Michael Desmond, Hackney Downs Ward. Councillor Webb, Hackneywick. Michael Levy. Councillor Sprinkler. And Councillor Claire Potter, who's just joining us. So we've got a uh, reasonably full house this evening. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, the various council officers present at this meeting uh, this evening, both in the room and joining us remotely. Um, these include um, Natalie Broughton, who's the head of uh, planning and building control, um, with Graham Callum, who's the growth team manager, and John Sang to my left, who's the um, manager. Uh, We've got um, the following council officers will be speaking to the following planning applications. Um, agenda item six will be led by Alex Hauser. Uh, item seven will be led by Erin Glancy, and item eight will be led by Danny uh, Huber. Other council officers in present uh, include uh, Gareth Sykes, our governance services officer, Christine Stevenson, our legal services officer, and Anzwar Hussein, who will be online uh, looking after our ITT for us. Some of you joining us this evening would have contacted uh, Gareth, the Governance Officer, in advance this meeting to register to speak. Objectors to the applications and representatives for the applicant are also in attendance. Before we continue, I'll briefly outline how this meeting will proceed. We'll hear each planning application in turn, summarised by the planning officer. We will then hear a five-minute statement from the objectors, followed by a five-minute statement from the applicant. If there's more than one speaker from an applicant or an objector, they'll have to agree amongst themselves beforehand how they will split the five-minute speaking time. Members of the planning subcommittee will then be free to ask questions of the planning officer, the objectors, and the applicant. In my role as chair of the planning subcommittee, I'll ensure that members have everything that they need to make a decision that objectors and applicants have the opportunity to say out their case and that the meeting runs smoothly. I will not be taking any contributions from the floor. You must have given notice to the governance officer before the meeting in order to register to speak. The deadline for registering to speak was 4 p.m. yesterday and the speaker's list is now closed. Subcommittee members are not representing either their wards or their political parties. Members will make decisions on the basis of site visits they've made, what they've read in the published application report, and of course, what we hear this evening. We must make any decision on, a, on an application in accordance with the Council's development plan, including the Council's local plan LP33 and the London plan, unless relevant material planning considerations indicate otherwise. And subcommittee members are reminded not to take into account or discuss non-material planning matters. And when taking a decision, members should not have allowed themselves to prejudge any application prior to this meeting. Similarly, if a member has any interest related to an application on the meeting agenda, they must consider whether what interest ought to be disclosed and where appropriate, they must withdraw from the meeting while the application is discussed and voted upon. When we have finished our deliberations on a planning application, I will read out the recommendation as set out in the published application report, and then members will vote on the recommendation by raising their hand. When the decision is made, that is normally the end of the matter for this subcommittee. The applicant may appeal that decision, and objectors may seek legal redress. I advise you to seek legal advice in either case. And finally, depending on how the meeting this evening progresses, we'll take a short break around 8 p.m. And we'll now go to the published meetings order of business, uh, beginning with item one. Uh, apologies for absence, Gareth. You know, Chair, as discussed before we started the live recording and the streaming, for anyone who's watching the meeting on YouTube at the moment, uh, due to technical fault, uh, one of our cameras is down, so the council officers would normally appear on the screen. 
uh, but they won't be able to because the camera that normally is on them isn't working. But they will be using the microphone, so you will be able to hear them. So, uh, thank you. But on with apologies for absence. And I've heard from Councillor Joseph, Councillor Sadek, and Councillor Samatar. Great, thank you. Any other apologies for absence that anyone knows about? No? Great, thank you. In that case, we'll go to uh, item two, declarations of interest. Um, I have one. Councillor Desmond, do you want to kick off? Uh, yeah, declare a non-pecuniary interest. I know Edward Benyon, who's been a great supporter of the Speaker's Office, but it's non-pecuniary, and I'll sit in, I'll be impartial in my judgment. Great. And similarly, um, I am uh, in contact with Ed, uh, Mr. Benyon on various issues and on uh, using the mobile block as well. So, thank you. Uh, any other application, any other um, conflicts of interest? So you draw uh, Chair, I just want to highlight, obviously, a councillor is ready to speak in objection for item seven. Yep. So obviously, you all, as members, fellow oh, councillors, yeah. all know that. We do know Councillor Rath, though. Yes, just to clarify. Thank you. Um, item three, consider any proposals or questions referred to the subcommittee by the council's monitoring officer. None? None, Chair. Great, thank you very much, Gareth. Um, terms of reference, um, this is for noting. It is indeed, Chair. It's just, uh, obviously, at the last council meeting on the 24th of July, uh, the new constitution, which is now live, went live on the 4th of September. It included a newly formatted uh, planning subcommittee terms of reference. As far as I'm aware, the content of that terms of reference hasn't changed for that committee or for your committee um but it's just in a new format now so uh, yeah so can we just note the new format thank you great thank you very much and uh, minutes of the previous meeting uh, these are for approval so we have meet minutes for the 5th of july and the 25th of july meeting um can you note those if there are no questions or comments Noted. Great. Thank you very much. In that case, we move on to item six, which is 449 Kingston Road, and we're being led by Alex. Thank you. Can we grab the lights? Thank you. Um, so, planning application 2022-1765 proposes to redevelop the site at 449 Kingsland Road and includes provision of approximately 1,100 square metres of commercial floor space, 150 square metres of community floor space and one dwelling house. Um, it is noted that following the publication of committee papers, minor changes were made to the published report as outlined within the addendum, including updated documents, these two updated documents include um, additional plans. One of these additional plans is of the existing north-facing um, hall, and the second is um, of the proposed north-facing hall, um, as it was brought to the attention of council officers that there was no plan that included the ground floor windows um, in this elevation. Um, additional objections were also received in regard to land titles, ownerships, and fencing. Um, and there are minor amendments to wording um, and inclusion of two additional conditions. Um, so the site comprises an irregular parcel of land located to the rear of numbers 419 to 455 Kingston Road to the east of the site and 106 to 140 Hartford Road to the west. The, south, the site benefits from access points from both Kingston Road and Englefield Road to the south. The site falls within the Kingsland Road Conservation Area and is bounded directly to the west by the de Beauvoir Conservation Area. The site is occupied by a two-storey former industrial warehouse, referred to as the tram shed within application documents, a long flat roof two-storey outrigger, referred to as the outrigger, um, adjoins the tram shed to the south along the back gardens of neighbouring residential properties, stepping down to one storey towards Englefield Road. The main building has a triple-pitched gable-ended roof with windows on all elevations and is constructed from brickwork and a corrugated metallic roof. Um, so the site is currently occupied by a Pentecostal church, the Amazing Grace Worship Centre, which provides hall hire facilities and is accessed from Kingsland Road to the north of Wellbury Court. Uh, the church only actively uses a small area of the total floor space, pri primarily the main hall on the upper floor, for their maximum congregation of up to 60 people. 
Um, it has been indicated that generally the number of attendees to their day-to-day -day services is considerably less than this. Uh, the church operates only on Saturdays and Sundays for a total combined hours of 12 and a half. Um, the property is generally in poor condition and is, need of is in need of repair and maintenance with large areas under occupied by the current tenants who have struggled to maintain their rent. Original features such as critter windows have been boarded and blocked up as part of the current conversion and poor quality partitions have been added. So a secondary access from Kingsland Road between Wellbury Court to the north and the former public house to the south is currently only used as an exit. The third access point to the site is from Englefield Road and sits between numbers 8 and 10 Englefield Road. This access point provides stairway access to the roof of the outrigger. At present, this access is not in use. So the property is bounded by residential properties on all sides. Um, houses to the west, which front Hartford Road, um, which can be seen in these slides, are locally listed and fall within the de Beauvoir Conservation Area. They comprise two-storey hipped roof cottages with a high degree of uniformity. Uh, houses to the east, fronting Kingsland Road, are also locally listed and fall within the Kingsland Conservation Area. They comprise stock brick terrace properties with a scale of three storeys over the basement. So the proposed commercial use will be located within the main building, the tram shed, which will be retrofitted internally um, to create three levels. The existing masonry walls will be retained and propped with new internal lying and lining and infills not walls where necessary. A new thermal envelope will provide additional insulation. Access will be provided from Kingsland Road between Wellbury Court and the former Prince of Wales Public House. The office use will provide 606 square metres of lettable space over a ground, mezzanine and first floor with 563 square metres of circulation and service spaces. A single storey extension to the north of the existing building will replace the existing extension. The community use is proposed within this section of the extension. The building would be accessed from Kinsland Road to the north of Wellbury Court. The extension would have a pitched roof with a central flat roof light and extend slightly above the existing boundary wall. The building will be clad in zinc with a louvered access way to Kings and Road. A green roof is proposed as part of the, of the building. Um, secure secondary access will be provided from Englefield Road to the outrigger. The outrigger will pro provide comprise predominantly ancillary services, including end of trip facilities, cycle and bin storage. A small number of meeting pods and rooms are located within this area. Um, as part of the proposal, the roof will be removed and replaced and raised by one metre. The new roof covering is to, proposed to be zinc and will feature roof lights and PV panels. As part of the proposal, original window openings are proposed to be reinstated um, on all elevations with crittle style windows with acoustic glass. The existing outrigger roof will be replaced with a green roof and include roof lights and a fire exit and means of escape. Um, the ivy as seen in, on the existing outrigger walls will be retained as part of the proposal. Um, to the south of the site, the slot house is proposed to extend half the width of the plot at ground floor level to allow for a secure commercial fobbed entrance way to the west. The slot house will be four storeys in height and provide three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Cyclone waste storage is proposed within the front garden. The slot house will be clad in London strop brick with zinc and triple glaze powder coated aluminium windows. Access for the rear courtyard would be for maintenance purposes only. Juliet's balconies previously proposed has been, have been removed as a result of officer feedback. Um, the application is considered to um, result in public benefit due to the provision of higher quality community floor space and the provision of one residential dwelling. Um, all other material considerations are outlined within the officer report. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, in objection, we have two objectors. We have Diana Weir and Emma Devereaux. Yeah, thank you. Are you both speaking? I'm Diana Weir. 
I live and have done for about 30 years in Hartford Road. Yeah, sorry, are you, are, you, are you both going to speak? Predominantly Diana is going to speak. Okay, um, thank you. Got a bit so, so Diana's going to start off. Sorry. Rather rapid speech from the other end of the room. I think sorry, it's sorry. So you're starting off, Diana, yeah. and then do you want a... Um, do you want a time to be told when you got there? Uh, I'm rather hoping that Emma's going to keep me honest. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> but okay. Yes, if you happen to be telling me there's a minute to go, I'd love that. You Thank you. The lights may work, and it, when it comes to Amber, you have a minute left. So it may not work, so rely on your phone. Okay. <laughs> That's all right, yeah. Um, so you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'm Diana Weir. I own and have lived in a house about three houses north of the tram shed on the Hartford Road side for the last 30 years. Emma, correspondingly, has owned and lived in a house, a few houses south of the tram shed on the Kings and Road side for about half that long. Yeah. So we have opposing, <laughs> diametrically opposing positions, but a large degree of agreement about what we would prefer this application to do. In essence, the residents on all sides of this development, as far as I've been able to find them, support renovation in principle of this building, which has become, frankly, an eyesore. What we don't agree with are all the elements of the design of these proposals. Not to sound rude, but it is, in a sense, building-centric. It doesn't pay enough attention to the context in which the building sits. And it is a very unusually alien building. It's industrial, it's entirely surrounded by residential properties, which are mostly locally listed, whereas it is a rather crude shed, less than 100 years old, but with no architectural merit. And its design is not remotely compatible with its neighbors. Its walls, the walls of the tram shed itself, because it has no open ground of its own around it, or virtually none, are in fact party walls. So there's no open space to mitigate the effect in its setting. At the moment, as I think Alex said, it's laid out on two floors, but the envelope of the main building contains enough height to accommodate three floors without raising the roof. And that is a major element of objection for the residents surrounding it, because it is already a very large, very high and very bulky building, which significantly deprives the neighbors to directly to the east and west of light. I noticed that the Hackney Society Planning Group objected that they thought the proposal to create an additional floor by raising the roof seems heavy, and will impact on the light of the dwellings to the west, that is the Hartford Road side. I have not been able to find a reason or justification given for raising the roof height. The, if the existing internal height will take three floors, I suspect by decreasing the rather generous ceiling height of the ground floor, then surely they should just reduce that ceiling height rather than raising the roof. It may be only a meter, but in the context of a large three-story building jammed up against its neighbors and their gardens, it's a huge obstruction. Secondly, the plan is to use extremely dark cladding, both all over the new community hall and on the main building roof, including the vertical element of the raised roof. That's inconsistent with the much lighter colored plate grey roofs of all the listed buildings around it, and also of the much newer Welbury Court, which stands between the tram shed and Kingsland Road. A very dark or black roof would be obtrusive in all weathers and at all times, whereas the present faded red one looks pleasantly like old terracotta and it's rather pleasant against the sky in all weathers. I compared it, and I don't apologize for this, to putting an artificially black wig on an elderly and rather scruffy person. It looks out of place. I don't see the argument for a contemporary design on an, an early 20th century shed. I don't think it needs dressing up. Oh, God, okay. 
Um, the other aspect of this is intrusiveness. It is proposed to open up all the windows that there were on the tram shed and introduce more in the raised roof. That would contravene a restrictive covenant granted in the late 1950s by the Benyon family and intended to benefit, well, it does benefit, land that they owned or had lately owned, which consists effectively of Hartford Road, houses on Kingsland Road, and arguably Welbury Court. They should be entitled to keep their rights of light and air untampered with. If these opening up of windows goes ahead, they will lose that protection. Um, I think from my perspective, I'm here as a kind of a mother, really, of um, myself and my neighbours. Between us, we have five children. Um, and basically, we would like it to be that the, the windows are all frosted, okay. not just the lower levels, basically. And okay. we're just worried about people watching our children, I think. Great. Right, okay. Thank you very much. So that's over five minutes. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, both of you, for that. Um, we have um, supporting... Uh, we have Edward Benyon, the applicant. We've got Alex Marrett, Marrett sorry, um, from Marrett and Company, the architect. And we've got Adam Williams, who's the planning consultant. Can I ask who's planning to speak? Okay, do you need a um, signal or? Yeah, a two and a half? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, as noted by Alex in her presentation, uh, the existing building is under-occupied by the Amazing Grace Worship Centre and has fallen into a poor state of repair. And the tenant is struggling to afford the space and is unable to maintain the building. Um, the building is also suffering from poor accessibility and the current use and configuration uh, is not sustainable in the medium or long term. The site is within the Kingsland Conservation Area and the building itself has been identified by the Council as a non-designated heritage asset. And there are also a number of other locally listed buildings in the vicinity of the site. This heritage context, context has directly informed our approach for development of the site. Working in consultation with the Amazing Grace Worship Center, we developed the design for the scheme, which retains, refurbishes, and converts the building to provide new high quality employment space, whilst also providing a new purpose built community hall specifically for Amazing Grace to meet their needs which can also be made available and will also be made available to other local community groups when not being used by Amazing Grace with bookings to be managed by the Benyon Estate. The proposals have been designed to preserve surrounding residential amenity and with regards to the point made by Mr Devereaux, um, the obscure glazing would be obscured and fixed up to 1.8 metres from finished floor level. So there is no opportunity to look down into the garden from, from within the building and that would be secured by planning condition. Um, also, the proposals that have a very limited effect on daylight sunlight to nearby properties, as demonstrated in the daylight sunlight assessment. We've taken on board comments from the local community during public consultation and subsequently omitted the residential news element of the scheme, which addresses the vast majority of the concerns that have been raised. With regard to the points raised by Mrs. Weir, um, in terms of the, the point in relation to the restrictive covenant, that is a civil matter, that's a matter of common law and is, is not a material planning consideration. But just to clarify, that element of the title purely means that the windows or the owner within 449 Kingsland Road um, in common law cannot make a rights of light claim to any development that's affecting their windows. It's not the reason why the windows were boarded up. Um, but again, it's not a material planning consideration. Um, in terms of the raising of the roof, the roof is being raised by 782 millimetres, which within the context of the building as a whole is, is a very limited increase in height and the impact as demonstrated in the daylight sunlight assessment is pretty negligible. Um, I'll now hand over to, uh, to Alex Mur, who can take you through the design rationale for the scheme. Good evening. The design starts with how to adapt and sustain this ex-industrial building. The building is a non-designated heritage asset and is on the backland site, predominantly surrounded by the residential neighbours. There is a friction between the two that stems from its historic use. So since the cessation of that industrial use, it's been used for large congregational uses. These have not always been compatible with the residential area in terms of quite often late night and very early morning operating hours and large numbers of people coming in and out uh, of the building next to those residential uses. So the design starts with including a 60-person community hall, considerably smaller than the existing, which is more compatible with those residential neighbours and 
uh, and is certainly more compatible than the industrial original use. It's been designed at a size that will be economic and workable for small local groups, including the current tenant, the Amazing Grace, and we have their support. The proposed community hall is at the north end of the site and in location to the existing projecting staircase that sticks out one and a half stories of the north facade. The new hall is lightweight and made from sustainable timber frame structure and it's got shallow foundations because it's near the existing chestnut tree. The main element of the scheme though is the studio space for small and medium enterprises in the tram shed volume. In designing the scheme, we studied the building's history and found plans showing an original central atrium cut in the middle of the building. It's page 43 of your design and access statement. We found a sister building in Woolwich Road in Greenwich, built at the same time and almost precisely the same dimensions. We have a photograph of the opening in the centre of that building. So the proposal is to reinstate this central atrium that once would have been in this building and its sister building in Greenwich. The atrium, therefore, turns the views inward, away from the neighbouring houses. It will make the original primary steelwork as part of the heritage asset visible in the building where it's not visible today. You can see page 61 of the design and access statement. By reinstating the central opening and reconfiguring the north pitch of each of the three rooms for fresh air and daylight, we can create a high quality space within the main tram shed volume without enlarging or opening any uh, new windows outwards. The southern roof pitches are kept blind to stop overheating and are used for PV panels to generate sustainable electricity for the scheme. Can you wind up please? Thank you. The original windows in the tram shed and the outrigger are reglazed using replica crittle style windows and to retain the character. And as Adam has explained, these will be frosted and fixed shut up to 1.8. Okay, that's fine. There is just You're... one point that's come up since uh, you mentioned. Can we... uh, can we take any questions just because I need to keep uh, this fair about, between about the minutes? Floor right? we can, yes. We'll take any questions, that's fine. Thank you. Could I ask you to turn your microphones off? Is that right? Thank you. Great, okay. Um, we've heard the applicants and the um, people speaking in opposition. Um, do I have questions from the committee? Yep, Councillor Desmond. Well, it seems to be a significant improvement and it's making use of an existing building and is adding to the area. But there are a couple of things, and I think the objectors are, are right about perhaps the colour of the cladding. Is there any reason why it's going to be so dark? Is there anything we can do to change that? I would like clarity as to whether the roof has any asbestos on it. You're proposing to put a zinc roof on. I'm not familiar with zinc roofs. Are there particular qualities that would benefit uh, the development by having a, a zinc roof? And uh, can you confirm that you are are going to be sensitive as and when the construction takes place in terms of noise nuisance affecting the neighbours because it is a, a dense residential area. Um, I can answer the questions about zinc. Um, one of the reasons why we've used zinc in this project and in other projects, so in the Morpeth Road uh, conservation area in Hackney as well, um, we had it approved, is to do with PV panels. What we found is these schemes, we want to make them as sustainable as possible, uh, and PV is a big part of generating on-site electricity, which helps the, helps the building. The PV panels, you don't get a choice. They are generally, as you've seen on most schemes, either very, very dark, dark blue or black, um, and the dark of the zinc hides those solar panels, so you don't see a kind of another layer on a lighter or a coloured uh, roof. Um, in terms of the technology you were asking about, is there a, a reason to use zinc? Um, zinc is a fantastic material. In it's not you don't need to clean it. Um, it's a standing seam zinc roof. So if you think of cathedral roofs, the last several hundred years, often lead or uh, zinc or copper, uh, they're folded uh, very tightly and therefore form something that's very waterproof and therefore maintenance is very low. Um, it's totally recyclable, unlike a steel, if you use the powder coat and painted steel, um, that process means the steel isn't recycled at the end of its life. So that's that's the reasons behind the uh, zinc. In terms of the asbestos, we haven't done uh, full surveys yet. We haven't found asbestos at the moment. 
Thank you. Can I just uh, follow up on Councillor Desmond's question with the height question? So you're um, increasing the height of the roof by, you said, 782 millimetres. What's, what's the benefit of that? What's the, why are you choosing to do that? Thank you. And then I'll bring in um, Luciana Grave, who's the design um, officer, just to give her a chance to prepare online. Uh, so, uh, as we were outlining, we looked at whether we could reuse the existing roof trusses as our first point of reusing as much of the fabric as possible. Um, those roof trusses we tested, and there's a structural analysis in the design and access statement. Their roof trusses were obviously built for an uninsulated tin roof back in the uh, 1920s. Um, they won't take, the existing roof trusses won't take the weight of PV panels, current snow loads, insulation, and the skylights that we need in order to pull light down into that central core. So for that reason, structural reason, the roof uh, trusses need to be uh, upgraded uh, or replaced. We then were partly looking at uh, embodied carbon in the building. One of the major elements of the embodied carbon in the building is the primary frame that sits around that opening. So to support the trim of the uh, opening and the concrete of that first floor, which is in place and is a generous uh, ceiling height. If we took out that floor just to lower it to 780 mil, which we'd need to do, uh, it would be a significant uh, lot of dust and uh, disruption to the neighbours, but a significant lot of hardcore that needs to be taken off the site, embodied carbon within that, and then a replacement of the same thing. We'd have to be uh, uh, basically bringing new material in. So from a, both a construction point of view and an embodied carbon point of view, that's the major element of the scheme. And for those reasons, we chose to retain and work with the existing floor level. Uh, it has some exposed, quite nice riveted steel work, and we can keep that as part of the heritage asset. So on balance, we decided to keep that floor. Thank you very much. Um, do you mind me, sorry, Alex, um, do you mind me going straight to Luciana? Is that right, on design? Uh, hi, Luciana, um, uh, so you're online. Um, so just questions around um, the, the planning authority's view on the zinc roof. Is that a major change from the roof that's there at the moment? Um, the objectors mentioned the fact that the, um, the, the roofing in the residential houses around was um, as a terracotta tile, not um, not dark grey, obviously, and then that sort of raise in the in the design as well. As what's what's the view of um, of your team? In terms of the existing roof covering, uh, my understanding is that it's not an original roof covering what's there at the moment. So although we have found the loss of the historic trusses regrettable, uh, it's not something, um, you know, and, and we have identified as, as a very minimal sort of um, harmful impact um, in terms of the loss of that kind of roof form historic roof form but the roof covering as I said is not historic and the proposed uh, zinc is not we, we there, there have there has been the use of zinc in conservation areas uh, quite quite a bit like um, and particularly for roof extensions um, zinc is not an, uh, an unusual material to be used in this sort of context uh, i do appreciate that the houses may have terracotta uh, roof tiles but the houses have a different character to this building this is a backland building that contributes to the character of the area but it is a building of a different use and is a, a building of slightly different character and the use of zinc is not seen as something negative uh, we found that the the benefits also of insulating that roof are um are welcome and outweigh particularly the harm of the loss of those uh, trusses and the, as then i as i understand the increasing height is is marginal too um and we don't see that as as a as a negative impact in terms of character and appearance of the conservation area thank you does that clear for people um council Potter? You just say who is for uh, if you sorry uh, whether it's the applicant's objectors officers that'd be great go to, go to the applicant first who uh, oh, just sorry. If you let us know who it's for who the question yeah for. thank you chair um you answered most most of my questions i just wanted to understand a bit more about the covenant and i know the old the object has talked about it i know the applicant said it wasn't planning consideration but i'd like to hear from you a bit more it was hard to hear sorry it's hard to hear exactly what you know the covenant was and what it meant and, and the consequences but also from you that it's not a planning consideration please 
Absolutely. So I'll first go to the um, contents of the covenant, um, which I have reviewed and, and discussed with um, the applicant. Uh, what the current covenant talks about is um, the facts of the existing building. So number 449 cannot benefit from right to light. So um, as Adam outlined, this meant that a claim can but not be made by the occupier of number 449 um, in legal terms um, if adjoining buildings reduce the right to light within number 449. So it doesn't have an impact on the external um, building, so it's more about within that building. Um, restrictive covenants are not a consideration material to the grant of um, planning application, so um, the planning authority doesn't take these into account or seek to analyse the covenant's true meaning or the legal effect of these. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Councillor Young. Just to go back to the roof quickly. Um, not very good at maths. So this this is less than a metre. You're raising the roof by less than a metre, yeah? And can I check whether, and I can't quite work this out from the pictures, um, does this then raise the roof so that it is actually sort of interfering with what you see out of your windows from either of these premises? from the neighbours. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just get um, a, a plan up to show Thank you. you. 78.2 centimetres, I think. Um, so there are two, oh, it's it's really actually difficult to, to see. Um, sorry. Is that visible now? Okay, great. Um, so in terms of the height that is raised, it will be visible. Um, it is important to note that it is set slightly back from the um, facade of the building, so it will be inset. In terms of the visibility, that's something that's been assessed in terms of outlook as not causing um, adverse impacts um, on neighbouring occupiers, given um, the location of the building, but also the minor increase in height. So, turning to the um, one of the objectors mentioned, the sort of the overlooking, um, and whether there were whether it would be possible to frost the windows or do something which meant that the neighbours didn't feel overlooked. Is that something that's been considered? Is that something you think would be appropriate? Uh, yes, so it has actually been conditioned that all windows are obscure glazed to a height of 1.8 metres and um, fixed shut. So that's the standard height in terms of what we would consider. I know there were some objections raised about frosting the whole windows, which is something yeah. the committee can consider. But um, from my... In my professional opinion, the idea of people standing on chairs to look over um, at the top of a window um, in an office building is unlikely um, to cause significant um, overlooking concerns. So the height of 1.8 is kind of the standard approach that we take um, in overlooking concerns and, okay. and terms. I, my understanding, and we can check this with the objector, was that what she was saying was she wanted windows all the way up the building to be frosted rather than the window to the top of the window. Can we just check that? Uh, yeah, sorry, the, can the, yeah, the objects are just... Um, yes, yeah, so basically where our, our houses are, um, there's going to be two rows of windows going up and they're proposing just to frost the first layer, but that doesn't stop people on that floor looking down into our gardens, basically. Um, yes, yeah, so it's been conditioned that all windows on all elevations, so not just... So you're talking about different levels? Is that a different, like, ground level and first floor level? So where I'm in 443 and 445, okay, on the southern side, isn't it? Um, and at the back of our... Yeah, so the back of our gardens are right up against one side of the main section and then the side of the outrigger, okay? Of that, we have windows that are bricked up currently that run on one level about one and a half 1.8 meters something like that but there is another level of windows up on the top of that those are also proposed to be open and we would like those to be frosted for our privacy yes yeah. yeah, so as part of um the, one of the conditions attached the, the windows on all levels so the the ground floor and the first floor will be um obscure glazed to a height of 1.8 meters ah so it's from the floor Okay, yeah. right, okay, yeah. that makes sense. From each floor level, 1.8 metres above. Not so not from the base. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, 
Um, that was yeah. just sort of noting that at 5.7.12, we are saying that the proposed development includes a number of new and reinstated windows. So there are more windows. I've got one more question. Um, the So the covering of the roof, absolutely hear what you say about uh, zinc not being problematic in itself. Um, was consideration given to alternative, you know, appear roofs that would be roof coverings that would be sort of of a different type of appearance, um, in light of the objectors' concerns that this just looks and feels very, very different to what's there now. I'm sure. So I will talk to this first, but then maybe we might want to get Luciana in from a design point of view. Um, so basically, we have to assess schemes um, that come towards us. Obviously, we've had discussions with this. Our design officers have looked at this and found that um, in design and appearance terms that it would have um, an acceptable um, impact on the surrounding uh, conservation area, as Luciana has raised. It's a different, um, it's a building of a different typology as opposed to the existing ones around it. So a more modern, modern approach wasn't um, considered contrary um, to the character and appearance of the area. Luciana, I don't know if you have anything that you would like to add to that. Yeah, Luciana, I think. Um, I'm not sure if I can add much, <laughs> just in terms of repeating what I've said before, that, you know, we, we as Alex said, we had to judge the, the proposals on, 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 on their merits. So we had to look at what was in front of us and we did not consider the zinc to be harmful. And as I said, the, the, there is precedence of the use of zinc in conservation areas, uh, particularly uh, on buildings of this typology. Perhaps, I don't know whether um, the architect could um, or the applicants could sort of add anything in terms of, of whether any other material would have been explored. I guess there is also the, the sort of the sustainable aspect of it um, and also the, the, the the, the thicknesses because when you're thinking that you're improving the the insulation so that's adding a layer to it um, and then you're having the your the zinc the zinc is quite a thin material in itself so it doesn't add to the bulk of the building so perhaps that was a consideration from the from the applicants but I wouldn't be able to comment on those of the scoping sort of um, phase of, of the scheme but in terms of how we look at the impact on the conservation area as i said we, we didn't think it caused a degree of harm that that would raise objections from our side and can i just check it it's not the zinc roof is not replacing a sort of terracotta tile roof is it has it ever had a terracotta tile roof? no so the existing roof that's been sorry what so, yeah, yeah, yeah. fine 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 okay please don't interrupt it's fine terracotta covered yes yeah, so then it's, yeah, it's not replacing an, an, a terracotta original roof. Yeah, and it's, is the roof at the moment corrugated iron? Or? Yes, yeah, so yeah, okay. So just one follow up on that. Yep. So what proportion of the roof will be green roof or sedum roof? So in terms of the um, roof above the main uh, pram line building, so that the zinc roof, that will not contain any green roof. Okay. So that's all going to be PV panels and mm -hmm. roof lights. The green roof is atop the existing outrigger, so yeah. this this long um, roof at the back. I've got the I've got the roof plan too. Um, so as you can see here, this is all going to be PV panels um, and maintenance walkway, and the roof, the green roof, is on top of the um, existing outrigger. And if I can just come in, just sorry, I know Council Bosses wants to come in. Um, just on the green roof, there was a concern uh, put in by residents that it might be accessible, used as a terrace. Um, can you just confirm what the what the conditions are around that? Yeah, so that is it's not to be proposed to be used as a terrace, so it's proposed to be used as a fire escape only, um, and that can be conditioned um, if we need. I, I'm not sure if I've included a condition on that. I'll just have to quick ch check quickly. Yeah, could you check that? That's fine. And then, um, Councillor Potter. Um, I was just going to, uh, um, Diane, I think, um, raised, she talked about the intrusiveness, which I think we've covered a little in terms of the relationship with buildings around, but she also mentioned about there being no open space to mitigate any effects. I'm just looking to the developer and then the council, whether you've got any comments on that. Thank you, Councillor. In, in terms of the relationship between the building and neighbouring properties, it is an existing building and obviously as a non-designated heritage asset in a conservation area, we are seeking to retain that building. So the relationship between, I suppose, the elevation of that building and neighbours and obviously the site ends at the end of our building that we're restricted by, by the envelope of our site. 
think council so the the, uh, the the point was that i think it's a shared wall isn't it so the shared the, the wall the back garden wall essentially there the back garden wall is essentially the wall of the building is that right yeah if i could chair to just to clarify um and uh, the, the the envelope or i suppose the the external elevations of the transit building are not uh, are not actually party walls there, there were originally fences and low brick walls around the building that formed the rear garden walls. Some of those remain, some have been removed, but the actual building itself, the envelope is not. not okay, possible. okay, fine, fine, fine. Thank you. Does that make sense, Councillor Walter? Yeah, great. Um, other questions from committee members? Nothing coming up? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, Chair, just to check, is that definitely a condition that um, the green roof will, yeah, because that's the one concern that it will not be yes uh, use as a terrace that was the only um, clarification just to make sure that that does happen thank you yes so um 8.1.20 um of the report includes um a condition um limiting the use of the green roof um just for um, maintenance and emergency Excellent. great thank you and then just on the community space obviously we don't necessarily um um approve of um a sort of loss of community space why is that accessible in this case for the your team. Um, so specifically, if you look at um, LP8, um, which is community um, and social infrastructure um, of Hackney's local plan, so it looks at the specific wording looks at the loss of community infrastructure um, as opposed to the loss of community floor space. Um, so, and there are there's a specific circumstance where you're providing um, a, a floor space of a better quality, um, which in this instance it is as um, the applicant alluded to, it will be level access, um, it will be provided with better light, and it will be um, a modern building that kind of has greater sustainability standards. So in this instance, um, whilst there is a loss of significant floor space, which is currently underutilised and of very poor quality, the proposed replacement is considered to be a better and more suitable um, community um, use for the existing um, tenants who will be remaining on site. And they're remaining, and I know you they were in support, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then I think um, just in terms of the slot house, um, can we just um, have a bit of clarity? Because I think, is it right that this has already been approved previously on the current design, but it's been wrapped into this proposal, or is it slightly different? So it's slightly different. So it was when the slot house has been approved, obviously the grant, I'll get the plans up to show you. Um, so as can be seen at the top on the proposed ground floor, the slot house um, in its previous form um, extended the whole width of the site. It didn't require that um, rear uh, entrance for um, the commercial floor space. So apart from that, there have been a few design changes um, to the slot house, but it's very reminiscent to the, the previous um, approval in terms of its materiality and its height and bulk. Okay, um, any other questions from the committee? No? Okay, in that case, um, let's move to a vote. And thank you. So, the recommendation summary is to grant planning commission subject to the conditions that we've discussed this evening in the, in the report and a section 106 legal agreement. So all those in favour, please raise your hands. Thank you. That's unanimous. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, and if you could vacate your areas relatively swiftly, that'd be great. And we'll move on to item seven. Thank you. Can I see Colette? Hello, Colette. So if you come down here with uh, Councillor Rathbone, that'd be great. Thank you. And then looks like Jan or Jan, Ellis and Scott are moving into place. Great. Um, Councillor Rathbone, are you planning to speak? 
Would you mind moving to the front? Is that all right? Would you mind moving to the front? You do, yes, I'm afraid. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're moving on to item seven, which is Beaumont Court, up Caps and Road, um, and we're being led off by Erin. Thanks very much. We've got the lights. That'd be great. Once the lights are down, please start, Erin. This planning application has been reported to the planning committee, given the number of objections the council received. The objections mainly relate to design, amenity, standard of accommodation, transportational waste, sustainability and biodiversity. There was addendum to this application. This included an update to the plan numbers, further comments from the highways team and the addition of a demolition and construction logistics management plan condition. This shows the existing site, Beaumont Court. The existing building is five storeys and mixed use with commercial use at ground floor and residential on the floors above. The site isn't within a conservation area, but the locally listed tram depots to the south of the site. Sorry, can I just ask you, can I just ask you to slow down slightly? Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. I'm just asking. Thank you. Is that right? Thank you. Yeah, that's just fine. a bit slower. Thank you. Okay. Um. Okay. So there was an addendum to this application. This included an update to the plan numbers. Further comments from the highways team and the addition of a demolition and construction logistics management plan condition. This is the existing site. The building is a five storey Beaumont Court. It's mixed use with commercial use at ground floor and residential on the floors above. The site isn't within a conservation area, but there's the local listed tram depot to the south of the site. These are views from Beaumont Court from Upper Clapton Road. There's an area of parking at the front of the site, however, this isn't within the applicant's ownership and doesn't form part of this application. These are views of Beaumont Court on the left from Cleveland Road, which would be the main entrance into the new units. And then on the right, it's Beaumont Court from the rear from Casimir Road. These are photos from the southern side of the site. And these are photos from the rear of the site. The rear side of the site is used as informal car parking. This is a proposed ground floor plan showing the new lift and stair core, which would be for the new units, um, the new waste store and the new cycle store. The waste store and cycle store would be for the new and existing units. The cycle store has provision for 50 cycle parking spaces. This shows the proposed fifth floor plan. The scheme proposes five units. The housing mix would be three three beds, one two bed, and one one bed. All units meet the minimum space requirements. All units would be dual aspect, which would receive good ventilation and mitigate overheating. Um, all of the units would have step free access and meet building regulations requirement M42 for accessible and adaptable housing and the provision of one M43 wheelchair user dwelling would be attached as a condition. This is the proposed roof plan. The scheme proposes two renewable energy technologies. There's be PV panels and air source heat pumps located in the area shown in red. This is the proposed front elevation. The roof extension would be stepped back. The proposed materials would be brick and render and white cuttle windows, which would be in keeping with the existing building. This shows the proposed east elevation to the rear and the proposed north side elevation. This shows the proposed south elevation, including the new cycle and waste store and the new lift and stair core. And this is the final slide. It's a CGI of the proposed development. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Right, we're moving on to objectives. We've got Colette um, Goodfellow and Councillor Ian Rathbone. Um, and once we have some light shed on the situation, there we go. Um, the class, will you be sharing your time or um, who's speaking? Five minutes uh, each, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry, you're not sharing your time at all. I uh, know because you, the people online, won't be able to hear yeah. you. I'm afraid because it all goes to the it's microphone. Pretty, the microphone's pretty good. It should be able to pick you up. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Close. I. Yeah. yeah it, it's, you don't need to be super close. No, you're all right. Good. If you're there, like mm -hmm. you are now, you'll be okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. I represent the objectors to this scheme, largely, like myself, concerned residents of the 50 flats below. I therefore remind you that the term neighbours in this report largely refers to people living within the site boundary and construction site. Please consider this accordingly. The initial proposal for nine flats received 40 objections. This new scheme received 46, over nine times the number of new flats proposed. As our councillors, we ask that you support us today and do not grant this scheme. The site in question is the roof of our 85-year-old building, which currently sits in desperate need of repairs, including critical fire safety works and removal of building-wide contamination of asbestos marked as high risk. A specific question in the Council's application form asks for disclosure of site contamination, so we ask how the report could deem asbestos contamination not material. Nevertheless, the applicant chose not to disclose. We've urged the planning officer on many occasions to visit the site. We did not hear back. For further context, chronic roof leaks at Beaumont Court have caused water ingress and mould issues so bad that one flat was rendered completely unlivable. The 85-year-old pipework triggers persistent leaking issues. The building is well known to the police, SNT and council for persistent drug, noise and crime issues, 74 instances of which were logged in the building over the last over 12-month period. Therefore, as living conditions at Beaumont Court are currently poor, I hope you agree that any further degradation of our amenity would not be appropriate. Despite the scheme's attempts to segregate us via a private, separate access for the new flats, we are fundamentally the same building. We are happy to see the report's diligence in ensuring living standards are met across the new development. We call for the same diligence to be extended down to the homes below. The only reasonable way the council could be seen to endorse this scheme via approval would be if the following conditions are added. Suggested condition one, repoint brickwork and re-render existing facade to match the new scheme. Beaumont Court is already the tallest building in the area. The current facade is shabby and much of the render is stained and crumbling. For the proposed structure's greater presence not to harbour any negative impact on the streetscape, it is both relevant and necessary that every facade of the building is improved in line with the quality and materials of the proposed development. The current proposal fails to apply, comply with policies D3, D4 and LP1 and should not be granted on the clear basis that it is not compatible with the existing building and presents poor urban design. Suggested condition two, replace the building's windows with crittle to match the new development. This follows a suggestion made by the Hackney Society in the report. When referring to the photographs, please note that the new windows will not match the current buildings as 163 of the 204 windows at Beaumont Court are not original crittle, but various styles of white UPVC. The only way to create a unified design that will meet policy is to replace all the windows at Beaumont Court with the new crittle style. We strongly refute the report's claims that works to the existing facade are not reasonable or necessary. The proposed designs clearly interfere with the current facade, not only via the site massing, additional site massing, but also via the new rendered entranceway panel which spans our entire building top to bottom. Therefore, the existing facade is fundamentally part of the planning submission and design and any attempt to exclude it is nonsensical. Three, protect the 15 on-site car parking spaces for use of all residents. Four, reposition the proposed terraces to face outwards. It is not appropriate to have any balconies facing to the courtyard area just due to the clear privacy overlooking and noise issues that this will perpetrate. A simple adjustment to reface the balconies from proposed flats one, two and four to face outwards would result in less overlooking from these zones to the homes below. The balcony from flat three should be flipped to south facing so it can remain set back from the roof boundary. Five, extend our existing stairwell and lift cord to serve the sixth floor. This would not only create a unified community in the building, but would also greatly reduce the building work to create them, the loss of garden amenity and parking from their new footprint, and minimise the environmental and carbon impacts from their construction. The proposal's plans to build a new, separate, private lift court and stairwell to serve only the new sixth floor is clearly unnecessary and excessive when they both already exist in the building. Lastly, regarding the asbestos contamination and fire safety repairs due in the existing building, it would be dangerous to not add a condition stipulating that the proposed development will only begin once these critical works are complete. We have written to the Mayor of London calling for an update on the planning policy framework pertaining to rooftop build. It presently does not differentiate regular brownfield sites from buildings where hundreds of people live. 
There's already much reporting in the mainstream media about the damage and danger that these bills can create. The infancy of rooftop bills means that responsibility is on the council not to allow substandard developments to set precedent in this area of planning. Until okay. the relevant framework is created, you, our councillors, must act with extreme scrutiny when reading proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well Councillor Rathbone? Uh, five minutes when you start. You. Let me just um, time myself. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, colleagues. Um, First of all, I'd just like to echo what um, Colette has just said. This is a large elderly building. It's going to be extremely disturbing for the residents to have all this building work done. Um, I've been dealing with this building for about 15 years. And um, as far as I'm concerned, the owner has not been very responsive to repairs and improvements. And I'm being quite polite about this. Um, I, I don't think it's a good recommendation for the process being proposed in terms of care for the residents. Um, it's very clear that the owner seems to want to make a lot of money out of new building, but not actually prepared to put in the money into, as it were, the existing building. I'd also just like to add, Chair, that um, the last couple of days, a resident at 2 Cleveland's Road has been in touch with me. Um, they've been away abroad, um, and they object to the loss of light and the overbearing massing. The um, residents understand the need to meet housing criteria, but they feel that there are far more suitable and safe sites for new properties in Hackney than Beaumont Court. The very fact that Beaumont Court cannot be considered under permitted development due to its age fundamentally highlights its sensitive nature and the need for rigorous due diligence when assessing its suitability. Delivery of five flats is not proportionate with the level of objection in the community and loss of amenity in the 53 material concerns listed from the objection letters in the report. I ask, therefore, that you refuse on this occasion. The report deems the public benefits of the development outweigh the loss of amenity, but it does not adequately detail these benefits outside the provision of housing delivery. Residents see the biodiversity, quotes, net gain, unquote, in the form of bird and bat boxes, a green roof bike store and hedges, which already exist at the site, as inadequate to justify works of this scale and the reduction in shared garden space. Colleagues, this is a really terrible situation that's been going on. We were disappointed to find that the values disclosed in the DSLS misleading regarding this you will see that the comparable percentage values in the South Garden are based on two different sized spaces presenting overshadowing inaccurately favorable under BRE guidelines. In real terms, the lift shaft, bin store and bike sheds replacement will entirely close off the South Garden, greatly reducing its footprint and light amenity. In the initial proposed scheme, a communal roof terrace was proposed to alleviate this. This has been withdrawn in this scheme with no alternative provided. In the previously refused scheme, massing was cited as grounds for rejection. In that scheme, the majority of the massing viewable from Upper Clapton Road Street scene was on the sixth floor, which remains almost completely unchanged in the new plans. The seventh floor was much smaller and only a small five window section was visible from the road. The bulk of the massing is therefore still present and the scale of the development is still overbearing and inappropriate in a streetscape of two to three storey buildings. The first application was also refused for failure to comply with design policies. To now meet these criteria, it would be purely on the principle that a reduction in massing foreshadows good design. Additionally, um, you need to look at and uh, observe that the proposed fruit floor plan, that it um, does not form one cohesive building. Instead, each residence is a disconnected unit linked by external walkways. This plainly does not correspond with the H-shaped floor plan, does not reflect art deco design principles and clashes with the building's original design. This cannot be seen as responding to the architectural character of the host building and should not be considered acceptable. 
I'm sorry, Chair, I seem to have rather a lot to say here. The external walkways present new extensive sites for noise and much increased lines of sight into the homes below. If presumed that this decision was made to make the new properties triple aspect, then an attempt to increase the living standards of the new flats at the expense of the amenity in homes below is highly inappropriate. The first DSLS report submitted for this scheme failed to assess a single window at Beaumont Court. Sorry? All right. Um, in today's report, only 120 of the 200 residential windows are presented and no justification is given for their selection or location. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rathbone. Um, and in supporting, we have um, Jan Donovan, um, Ellis, uh, who's director of the planning consultancy, yeah. Um, Ellis Heath, who uh, is planner at the consultancy, and then, uh, sorry, who's Ellis? Hello. And then Scott, who is the architect, is that right? Are you, uh, you have 10 minutes to um, uh, allocate it. Um, are you all planning to speak? Or someone leading? Okay, fair enough. Um, you've got up to um, 10 minutes. Is the applicant here at all? Okay, thank you. Um, so up to 10 minutes and Jan, you, do you want a minute or are you timing? Are you, do you want a sign? Okay, um, whenever you're ready then, thank you. Thank you, Chair, members of the Planning Committee, and thank you to the officer for a presentation. My name is Jan Donovan, I'm the Planning Consultant. Um, as you're aware, this proposal is a residential development, a single storey roof extension on an existing uh, residential building with commercial at ground floor. Um, this is a response to a previous scheme, which was a two-storey, nine-storey, nine-unit scheme, which the council felt was, was too big for the site. And this application responds to the concerns of the council in relation to the bulk and mass, and also in relation to ensuring that we had BRE standards and M43 disabled access. Um, the scheme, we believe, responds positively to the concerns of the council previously. Um, most notably and importantly, the massing and height of the proposal has been reduced by one storey in order to respond to the, uh, better to the surrounding context of the site. It is also within the footprint of the existing building, set back on all elevations, which ensures that there's a, um, a, a subordinate nature of this additional floor. Um, there has been a daylight and sunlight assessment that's been submitted and it's been assessed in accordance with the BRE guidance required. Um, the details of that are set out in detail in the officer report, but we have um, un we understand that the, the accompanying report demonstrates that development demonstrates excellent compliance with the BRE guidance and overcomes the previous concerns of the previous application. The development is capable of providing an M43 wheelchair adaptable unit and is agreed with officers that this will be secured via a planning condition. Um, the, of the five units, three are family size units. All of the units are dual aspect um, and are deliver their own private amenity, all of which are in accordance with the, the Mayor's new housing design guide issued by the GLA. Um, during the course of the application, we have been had discussions with officers regarding the biodiversity and enhancements, and these have been agreed and included within the scheme. Um, overall, the, we believe that this, this development is a positive addition to Beaumont Court. Um, it's a redevelopment and optimization of an existing housing site. The provision of five new homes will hopefully will be welcomed, and the provision of three family-sized dwellings would be welcomed. Um, the scheme includes new sheltered storage space that includes for 50 cycles and we acknowledge the concerns of the transport officer and willing and more than happy to work with them in terms of the transport management plan to ensure that the cycle spaces are accessible and of mixed type um, so that they're one and two storey and also have the larger cargo bikes. We've also included um, improved bin stores for the existing residents and the future residents. Um, on-site biodiversity and urban green enhancements have been included and we can, we're happy to work with, with officers under a condition to ensure that they are um, durable and long-lasting and benefit all the residents on the site. Um, it has um, sustainable 
elements in terms of SOC pumps and, by, and UPVC and achieves over 40% in carbon savings with an offsite contribution of just short of £10,000. In addition, the applicant has agreed to a unilateral undertaking supporting the affordable housing policies of the borough and this will deliver £250,000 towards Hackney's affordable housing delivery schemes. I think finally we want to ensure that we, we note the concerns of the re existing resident in relation to um, existing issues they may have with Beaumont Court. We do agree with the office that they are out with this consideration of this planning application. A lot of the flats on site are long lease holds and so replacement windows and things have been done by the indiv individual tenants. I can speak to the to the owner of the site, we can speak to the applicant to see if they can work with, with, with residents to see if there can be improvements to the building. In terms of fire access, obviously there's a second set, second stair and second lift access posed for these units, which essentially was done in a way to ensure that less, less intervention and less concerns about putting this roof extension on the building and not impacting on the existing residents within the building because we won't be impacting on their stairwell, we won't be increasing their stairwell. It's a separate, complete, completely separate entity. Um, I think that is all I want to say. I don't know if you want to add anything, Scott. Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, just a couple of quick points, really, but then I'll make myself available for questions. I think Jan just um, touched upon a major point there is we've, we've, we've worked on numerous um, residential extensions on top of existing blocks across London over the, over the past... 10 or more years and there's two two major issues that come out from this and it, and it often comes down to the buildability and the disruption to the residents and that is the the scaffolding of the building the, it's the extension of lift cores stair cores sometimes the improvement or the increasing of widths of staircases for fire escapes or dda access for lifts and all of this becomes very disruptive to the building occupiers um, so at an early stage on this scheme, and it's, it's something that is becoming commonplace for extensions to buildings like this in London, which is to build the, the separate lift and stair core. Um, it's not a form of any form of elitism or anything like that to have this separation from the building. We've got absolutely no objection to both of the internal staircases um, being extended into the, um, the proposed new flats. But it is very much about trying to make sure that we can comply with all the DDA access, all of the um, fire escape access, without having that major disruption on, on the occupiers. Um, and then the other part to do with buildability is, is how we approach the structure of it. And so very early stage here, we've, we've, we've engaged with structural engineers to assess the building to ensure that we know that it can, um, it can take the load of an extension without having any major reinforcements or strengthening to the frame. And, there's an engineer's proposal that's been put forwards, which is that effectively it's a kind of a, a gridage of structure that, that goes onto the roof that spreads the load out without therefore causing a lot of disruption to the to the to the, to the, the occupiers below again. Um, so those, those are about the kind of things that we we now try to integrate into our schemes to try and avoid that disruption. I think I'd probably just say lastly, in terms of design, I know there was a bit of criticism there about the approach to this, but we wholeheartedly stand behind this. I mean, we, we could have approached this and just said, look, you know, set, set it back one and a half meters all the way around. It's a typical approach to a roof extension. Let's do something modern. Let's do something minimalist. We didn't, we, we unearthed the original architect's drawings. We, we, we really embraced the, the, um, the Art Deco architectural language of the building. Um, I'd stand by the two-story scheme that was withdrawn or re refused. Yeah, that, that actually had, more art deco embellishments than what we've got here but we've tried as you can see we've we've elongated the front bay of the building and actually in the original architect's drawings that bay was elongated about a meter or so higher than the existing parapet but it wasn't built that way so there's a nice nod back to the original architect that we've been able to do that and then we've not we've not filled the roof either you can see again on on the wings you know we've whilst we've set back on the front elevation, we, we've pulled in significantly, I think maybe six or so meters um, from those two wings, which again kind of reduces the um, visual impact of, of the extension from those long views. 
Um, but again, there's, there's additional stepping within that, the architecture of the, the roof extension. And you know, those, those curved windows, we're, we're really embracing that art, art deco language. It's not a, a plonk on rectangle box. We've really, it's a really well-considered scheme. And as Jan said, we've got dual, if not triple, a, triple aspect on all flats, fully DDA compliant, fully compliant with building regs. We've got the best sustainable technologies that we can put into a building, fully compliant with London plan. Um, and, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be frowning upon the net, the um, biodiversity net gain. That's something that's really hard to achieve in London. And, and we're doing that. Um, and that probably concludes what I've got to say. Um, but welcome okay. to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Um, questions from the committee. These um, these upward extensions um, often generate lots of conversation. Um, Councillor Desmond first, then Councillor Narcross, and then Councillor Presser afterwards. Councillor Desmond. The building hasn't been maintained to the high quality uh, that one would expect, and it's disappointing because it's in the prime location. Uh, and it has enormous potential. Um, I'm prepared to support this, but only if you accept condition one in principle, which Colette enunciated to do repointing and upgrading. The windows, of course, I would like to see changed, but I do agree that it's a matter really for leaseholders and it's not something really for the planning committee to consider. So could you clarify whether you would accept the condition the repointing and the upgrading, so that aesthetically, other Sorry, yeah, yeah, residents I'm gonna, are... Can you finish? And then I'm going to bring in John, not the applicant. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, would you accept condition one? Okay. John? Thanks, Councillor. Um, just to say that that suggested condition would be outside the scope of this application because it's not relevant to the proposal itself. Uh, we're not able to impose such a condition. Why not? Uh, the proposal relates to the erection of a roof extension alone, and we have to uh, assess the application on its merits, uh, regardless of the existing condition of the building. If, if you put a brand new top on a building that's spanking new and improving, the rest of it is poor and looking extremely depressed, it is relevant. So I personally, uh, believe that that would be a condition I would recommend. Chair, um, thank yep. you, Chair. Can I just point out that we need to be careful here. We have an application in front of us and any conditions attached to that application must be made on sound planning grounds. If not, we, the application and the decision in which the members reach can be judicially reviewed. Any, and, sorry, sorry, any condition attached must be necessary, must be relevant, and it must be in accordance with the actual application before us. It's an application for the fifth floor. And as, uh, we we talk about these things quite often. This, I mean, this would, if anything, um, the condition one would come to building control anyway. It wouldn't be a planning um, sort of issue to do with this application, I suppose. Um, we've got to disaggregate that sort of building control uh, sort of elements from the actual planning. Um, we're here to look at the application as it is, how it relates. Um, well, can I clarify from the applicant whether in doing Well, sorry, this, so Councillor Desmond, what are, you, what are you about to ask? Because I think if, if it's not a material planning consideration, then we need to move on. Well, I just agree. I've said it is. I have some well, expertise uh, in planning. Uh, well, our legal, our legal advice for six officer. years. I would like to ask the applicants whether you are prepared to do any of this without it being a condition. So well, maybe, because you hinted at it in your discussion anyway. Well, Councillor Desmond, they aren't the, they are the um, planning um, agency and the architects, so it's not actually the freeholder applicant um, in the room. So, uh, so they won't be able to answer on that basis. But anyway, you've had two officers um, tell you that it's um, it's not a planning, uh, material planning condition. So I suggest you take it up um, elsewhere after this meeting if you want clarification. Thank you, Councillor Desmond. Um, I had Councillor Narcross next. Um, yeah, so obviously, as, as you said, uh, sort of picking up on Michael's point slightly, you know, we, we've talked about this before, we've had other sort of roof extensions where the existing condition of the building obviously can't be part of the considerations that we make. Um, 
I was just wondering if there could be any clarity on, on whether there were conditions that could address some of the points raised by, by the objector um, in terms of, of sort of the condition of the building at all. But also just on this one, obviously, you know, thinking of the previous example I've got where we had this conversation, that was very much, I think, as you sort of said, the approach that you didn't take of just sticking something on top of it, recessing it, et cetera. Obviously, this one extends out and continues the original design of the building. So, so some of the fundamental design of this extension is integrated to the building as it is, exists. So I guess there is a question there of, you know, what work will be done to to blend those together? You know, will they be, you know, repointing that specific strip in the middle to make it all look, you know, appropriate from a design point of view? Sorry, I don't know why I'm looking over here. Um, you know, how far does that kind of work go um, to sort of blend these two essentially bits of the building together? Yeah, so I think it's annotated on the plans that that central section, the vendor on the main part of the building will be re-rendered and that will continue up into the new roof extension. Is that but only that section. Sorry, I didn't fully understand. You said that the, the, the existing um, bay on the front is extended up into the new section. And I think to answer the question, but I'm not sure necessarily that it's conditioned as such to go back to what you said, is, is that there would inherently, you, there, there is redecoration and, and works that have to take place as you work on the parapet levels and as you extend the bay. Um, and. A, as, as you've said, the applicant isn't here, but it's in the interest of the applicant to redecorate and tidy up the building um, as part of this this process. And, and I suppose, on sorry, drawings. sorry to interrupt. I suppose it's the it's the way in which the design integrates and is uh, relates to so the design as it is, not necessarily the condition of the design uh, within planning. Anything else, Councillor? Okay. Um, yeah, it was just a quick one. Just so, in terms of the, the finish of the of the extension, um, it talks about the color of the bricks. Is that you know, does that match the existing color of the bricks on the original building? Um, and that's all. So that all kind of you know fits in nicely that way. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, Councillor Potter, I had next. Anyone else looking to come after us? Um, couple of points. So. Mine, I think there was the objector raised about the balconies and the um, direction. Sorry, I'm using the wrong word, but reorientation. So I'd like to hear your comments on, on that. And then also, so the applicants and then officers and whether that can be changed. Can, but we, also, can, we, can we take that one first and then I'll come back for your second question? Yeah. Is that right? Um, so can we go officers first? Um, so balconies. Criticism being that they face inwards, not outwards. Um, can you just tell us a bit about that? Um, so, due to the existing um, H design shape of the building, it's already considered that there's a high level of overlooking. So, although the new floors will introduce views, these aren't considered to be so harmful over and above the existing situation. Okay, so that's why it's not a an issue. Is that right? That they are. Yeah. Facing. So then the question then to the to the uh, people supporting uh, the application is why is the why the choice of putting them internally focused? If indeed that's the case, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. The the orientation of the windows, uh, sorry, of the, of the amenity spaces were moved from the inside of the H to the ends of the H so that it is part of the discussions with the with with officers so that the 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 overlooking or the the the, the, the presumed overlooking was 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 mitigated and obviously so so essentially those those amenity spaces where we've set back from the edges quite considerably that's where those amenity spaces are rather on the narrow edge of the of the the units on the top it's quite hard to explain. <laughs> um, but does that does that make sense? You see the current. Uh, can you see the floor plan above here? Yeah. So two of the terraces, two of the sort of balcony terraces, are on the edge of the H. Yeah. Yeah, Gareth. Um, Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, do you mind putting a photo of it up, please, Erin? Um, obviously, when we assess amenity, we have to look at the existing situation. 
So at the moment, we've got a five-story H-shaped building with windows that go right up into the building line on all sides. So we have to take that existing level of overlooking and, and privacy um, into consideration. Obviously, what the proposal is seeking to do is to put on an additional floor, which is set back from the parapet, albeit with a few terraces. But the overall proposed accommodation, in our view, will not give rise to overlooking or exacerbate overlooking beyond the existing situation. But on that basis, we don't feel there's any harm that would warrant refusal in amenity terms. Okay, and then your second question. Um, so it's about the, uh, the lack of access, the cutting off access to part of the garden. Um, so the kind of cycle stores and uh, it would have been impossible to do that in a different way at all. So you wouldn't have um, cut down on that space, that shared communal space. I think one of the things we've we've discussed just coming into the meeting today is that we could look to um, compact the cycle storage and um, potentially use either um, the, the base of the staircase because as you can see in the floor plan there it shows the full kind of square shape if you like of the stairs but actually in reality as you enter a stairs at the bottom you only go it's only the bottom few steps that are taking up the space um, we think we could we could make a revision there that could compact that and maybe get some of the refuse storage in there and compact the um, cycle storage. Okay. Can I ask the officers, it's, um, this is, does, is this um, amenity space, is it, um, is it classed as amenity space, is it, um, is it usable space, is it what's, the, what's, been, what's been lost here? Um, so my understanding is that the southern portion of the site is used as a communal garden space. The communal garden space, yeah. and is that is that space protected in, in policy, or what's the what's that? No, so the southern portion, which is can within the kind of parameters, microphone, please. Sorry, is it? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the southern York courtyard is what we call communal amenity space. So essentially, it can be used by occupants of the building, be it existing or proposed. And um, the proposal does kind of obviously chamfer off access to it, but it doesn't prohibit residents using it. And there's no discernible loss of the community uh, communal amenity space. It's not something that is protected per se, um, but it's something we would seek to protect overall. When you say there's no loss, do you mean in totality, or do you mean? Uh, no in terms of, space, of the or? overall floor space, from my understanding, the, the place or the location where the cycle parking provision and refuse is is currently hard standing. Um, I don't know whether there's an aerial image that might show that. Yeah, so I'm um, sorry, so it does look there'll be a relatively minor loss of a brass area along the southern perimeter. Apologies, I've not been to the site. Um, but that wouldn't warrant refusal for us. It still provides a good quality standard of community amenity space. There's also a courtyard to the north as well, which is not being touched. Okay. Yep, I could just add to that that um, the main location of the bikes it's we're we're demolishing a redundant boiler storage room and it's not as as the officer just said it's not the grass garden area it's hard standing and an existing redundant building so it's currently hard standing okay yes yeah Colette can you turn on your application uh, sorry turn on your microphone Adam yeah, oh I can go mic. I can go um, it's used as a communal decking space the hard standing. It, it's definitely part of the garden space. There's pot plants tended to by residents, vegetables growing there, very, very much part of our garden, which we don't wish to lose. I'd also just like to point out that they are touching the front of our facade in regards to the point brought up before via this rendered section. So I really strongly have to refute that our facade does not form a material planning consideration. They are, they are bringing it they are bringing a render panel down the front. Why render one bit and not the rest? Completely nonsensical in, in our view. Everyone up here agrees. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Porter, I was on you, wasn't I? So, can you carry on and the rest? Um, I just wanted to say I'm disappointed that the um, ap ap applicant isn't here when you've got so many objectors. These, um, to make a decision on these, uh, and I realise we need to follow planning. Um, law, I realise that, but when you're kind of imposing something on top of an existing building where residents live and you're not meeting those residents and offering them 
improvements, it's really, really disappointing. And I hope you take uh, that back to your applicant. And I hope that they have, you know, they rethink the way that they're talking to the existing residents. And then we had, sorry, so we had, we haven't quite finished off the um, the amenity space. So we had a um, an offer or a um, from from the applicant around that. So can you just clarify what you said? Um, I was just saying that we could um, look at a reconfiguration of the the bins and bikes to try and compact that area so that we can push some of that into the spare space. Mm -hmm. Um, and is there reprovision anywhere else, or what's? There's, no, oh, sorry, so, of. Sorry, I'll bring. Yeah, okay. Sorry, bring the officer in. Um, so the plan on screen is um, amendments to be secured for an area of flower beds to the rear of the site. Um, and also a green roof to the cycle store to offset some of the loss of the garden space. Sorry, can you do that again? So what's changed? So the plan on screen is amendments that were secured for an area of um, flower beds to the rear of the site, and then also a green roof to offset the loss of this, the small loss of the garden space. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sorry, if I could just summarise. Um, there is additional landscaping which we're securing as part of the development which offsets the strip of land that would potentially be lost by the cycle park provision. There's also, as, as Erin pointed out, there's green roofs proposed for the cycle storage. So there is a biodiversity kind of net gain. Um, and there is, as I said, an additional offer to the northern part, which you can see the, the two green strips at the top there, um, which was secured as part of the planning application. Okay. Councillor Posit, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, who didn't have next? Was it Councillor? Who was it? Go ahead. Yeah. You go. <laughs> Come. On. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, when it says the roof terrace, do they mean roof terrace? Do they mean the walkways that are created just so that you can walk to the doorways? because it says communal and it's just well is that just black railings to communal roof terrace is that the, where you come out and you walk along because the concern um is i can see the terraces but then you have space outside that and what is stopping um the people living here kind of just climbing over their you know um, small railings and taking over the the rest of the roof you know is that condition that they can't do that i'm only saying this because from similar um sites when you can have an open space the people that live there um spread out and then put mini sheds and barbecues on their roofs and so the you know looking at it it looks all right but you need to protect that so that people don't um take over the the, the edging it's it's maintained so I just wanted to just check okay. what communal roof terrace means. Does it just mean the path, you know, the access, open access bits? There isn't a communal roof terrace. It is just the top bit where people can get to their doorways and that the people that live there know that they've got a terrace and that they are not able to yeah. um, step over and and also what they do on their terrace, you know. Could, could you just tell me what number that is and then pause back? Um, the one that says communal roof terrace. Yeah, what number though, sorry. Are you in the reports pack or the pictures pack? I'm in the big pictures big pack. Picture. Okay, um, sorry, can you tell me what, um, <coughs> do, um, officers, do you know what the, do you know the answer to this? I was going to suggest that the architect explains this. Um, we've, I, we were wondering whether that was a reference to the previous scheme because the, there's five sets of um, private immunity to these flats. Um, we would, we're open to any form of conditioning that can prevent um, access to other parts of the roof. Obviously, I would say that the kind of the deck access that you'd, you'd use as your circulation, it kind of self polices itself because you know you can't just start setting up a barbecue in the corridor. You know. You get, it doesn't happen inside and it doesn't happen in deck access um, blocks of flats at the moment, but um, we could have it so that the um, 
maybe there's a condition that puts some railings that prevents access to other parts of the roof. These parts of the roof could be green roofs so that they're not usable. Um, we're open to okay. what officers propose. Uh, yeah. Um, so our interpretation, do you, have you got the roof plan? Or actually, no, that's perfect, Aaron, sorry. That is the roof plan. Is that there is essentially communal kind of walkways between the units, and each unit has obviously a private terrace. Obviously, there's five units proposed, so there's not a great deal of additional kind of population, so to speak, that's going to be on that roof. So we'll think that the, the potential for things like gatherings and parties, given the constraints of the roof, is pretty minimal, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, if members would like a condition further restricting by fencing, that may be possible. Um, I would like to add that any structure that would go on, they would require planning permission separately. Yeah. So, sorry, so I think there's a, there's a couple of points here. So I found the reference to door to communal roof terrace. So there's no, there's no communal roof terrace other than the walkway up from the lift and the stairs around. No. Correct. Okay. And then if you look at the floor, uh, if you look at the floor plan of this, so you've got the slightly smaller terrace spaces, um, certainly on the, it's, this is basically on the southern elevation, is it where the, um, or oh, no, it might not be southern actually, but um, on, the, on the bottom of the plan here, um, with the terraces set back in, inside the floor plate by the looks of, it, of the building. So what's the current plan for that space that's not currently partitioned off as terraces on those two bits on the bottom horizontal part of the H. Um, they, are you talking about, so on this? Yeah, on, on this picture here, wings, yeah. there's a, so there's on the bottom tennis. of this, you've got um, flat four and flat five, yeah. attached to flat four and flat five on those edges, a, a terrace each. But then obviously the floor plate of the building is bigger than that. Yeah. So what's the what's the demarcation? What is the how big is that roof terrace? Um, how deep is the roof terrace versus the rest of the building? Because um, it looks if the roof terrace is a reasonable size, then the then the rest of the of the space in that building is t probably twice as deep. So is it accessible? Is it usable? Is it that's that's where people does that people where people get in? Sorry. Um, so, so the, there are private terraces for the flats. The private terraces will have a boundary against them, which is 1.1 meters. Beyond that, you're right. So, by a boundary, you mean a balustrade? A balustrade. Oh, so, 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 it's a balcony, but it's okay. a terrace. Yeah. And then beyond that is obviously the, the the flat roof. And those areas, we can have a condition that says they can only be accessible for maintenance only. Or as Scott said, they could even become green roofs. Um, or so, so we're quite happy to ensure that that the residents are not permitted beyond their existing terrace, and that could be um, managed by condition. Um, as we can quite easily, as part of the landscaping condition, include details of a green roof or okay. biodiversity roof, if, if that would be an option. Okay. Why is this not in here at the moment? What's the current plan for this? Sorry. So it's a green roof condition, but it's for the for the whole. Yeah. Okay. So the green roof, we can make the green roof condition the to apply to the whole of the. Yeah, absolutely. Not, we we can extend the green roof provision to areas of the roof where deemed necessary. We can just amend or tweak the condition that would meet the statutory tests. Okay. And check me and also add the condition that it, it cannot be used seriously, you know, yeah. otherwise the, the people then just climb over and, 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 and do that things. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Great. Two. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Councillor Young. So so just on green space and green roofs. Um at six point seven where we talk about biodiversity, we quote the um policy G six of the London plan, which is about biodiversity and green space and distinguishes between the two. So there's biodiversity, which you can satisfy with a green roof, and then there's green space, which you can actually use. So I, as I understand it, what the objectors are saying and what Councillor Rathbone is saying on their behalf is that the green, the existing green space, which is currently usable, um, will be less accessible to them. And I hear what you say about that not being protected, but we still have a policy saying we should be enhancing green space where there's a new as a plan for development so maybe that bit isn't protected but we should be enhancing it overall and that's separate to a green roof which they can't go and sit on or grow plants on thank you councillor um if we could go back to the layout plan of the ground floor 
Um, as we said, there is the southern communal courtyard will have kind of a gate to put up with fobbed access. So obviously, you've got the cycle parking provision and refuse, which was on a, a small proportion of land, which was essentially grassed. However, um, as detailed in the report, we have secured a condition for additional landscaping at the top of the site. I can't remember which orientation that is. It might be north or it might be east, for example. So there is a net increase there of additional landscaping that can be used, which in our view adequately offsets. I would like to point out that obviously um, the site is a rooftop development. So at the moment it's on an area of existing hard paving. So the development itself is no kind of net loss there. But there's loss on the ground. There's a small loss on the ground, but that's compensated by the additional landscaping at the top and the green roof as well. Which the which the existing residents can't use. So there is a loss to the existing. I just want to understand no, no, no. what we're sorry, talking about. Sorry, Councillor Young, the, the new, there's the new space on the ground. On floor. the ground floor. It's on a the ground floor end. plan up there. Okay. So this is the ground floor plan now. But you said it's compensated by additional greening on the roof no that he's not saying that it's compensated by the roof he's saying it's compensated by the by the additional, floor, additional. Yeah, floor. okay what he said i think one of um the difficulties i've had with looking at this is because the applicant hasn't bothered to turn up as mentioned and because we've been told that the applicant hasn't engaged with residents it's very difficult for us to know whether you know if the applicant did offer something slightly adjusted whether residents would be happy with it because then they're not here, so that's a shame. Um, on the uh, sorry, on the on the not material issues, I'm not going to go somewhere I shouldn't no. go. I'm not going to go somewhere. Material issues. <laughs> this is material. I think it's material. I just wanted to ask something about this. So, comments not material. One was structural stability and integrity of the building. So, I just want to understand. Presumably, you can't give planning permission for something that's sitting on something which is going to collapse. So you could you just can. tell us a bit more about that, Go that on. not being material? Yeah, that's looked at separately under building regulations. So obviously when a planning application is approved, it then consequently has to get building regs approval. They look at aspects such as structural stability. So our, so our job is design and um, it's someone else's job whether it's possible to mm -hmm. do. Okay, so on design. <laughs> Um, looking, can we just go back to the photo of the existing building? Um, on the question of design versus uh, doing works to get the existing building up to reasonable condition, um, can we consider whether in design terms the proposed um, extra building on the roof fits with what's below it? That's a design issue, presumably. Okay, so what's proposed to sit on top? I, I think I can't get in my mind from the plans and the pictures how in tune the roof, uh, the additional roof space will be, the new flats will be with the existing building. So objectors say it won't, and they mention, for example, the windows and the type of windows that will be put in above, compared to the type of windows below. Can you talk us through how they chip in ask, with each um, other? Yeah, absolutely. Can I ask Luciana to chip in here, please? Luciana, just on design, windows, and how um, the extension fits with the uh, rest of the building. Extension, that's the word. Um, so in terms of um, how it integrates with the building, we, we've, we have felt that the the sort of the the, the materiality, the style, uh, so the use of because we used of the uh, rendered bending with the matching brickwork, the the style of the windows also matching in terms of a critical style window, um, all of these kind of integrates really well with the with the host building. In particular, that that extension um, in the center. The extending that kind of main um, uh, central sort of piece uh, anchors it particularly well with with the host building, and also in terms of kind of respecting the Art Deco sort of composition on the on the primary elevation, the the being 
um, keeping the symmetry was is quite an important element too. Um, so we feel that overall, obviously, it's not uh, attempting to be an exact uh, match to what is there because we, you know there's a setback. But I think it actually respect it quite a lot by adding sort of like a, a, a kind of like a, a, an end to the building um, and by not being sort of overly dominant and uh, picking up on these sort of like references in terms of, as I said, brickwork, render, the style of the windows and particularly that central uh, piece uh, where you kind of like extending it to, to the top. So the windows are the same? I think objectors said the windows were not the same. Well, um, my, as many, existing ones are UPVC. Well, my understanding, the issue with the windows is that originally they would have been all crater windows, but uh, obviously, as I understand, some of them have been replaced, uh, not particularly in a you know in a very sympathetic way. So there isn't a, a sort of like um, all of the, in terms, the windows differ a little bit in terms of what's there because some of them have been replaced with uh, UPVC. But originally, and some of the uh, original windows are there, they would have been critical. And the and the proposal is picking up on that. You know, we, we would rather they propose something like critical, that is quality, than them picking up on the unsympathetic UPVC. So they've made the right choice there in referencing what would have been there um, originally. Essentially, the, the building has been pepper-potted with people who are in the buildings and replaced their own windows, mm -hmm. and they've put in um, UPVC windows. The, the applicant is referencing how the original windows would have been, so with critical. Mm. So, but if the building's all got UPVC windows and well, the applicant then puts so, in critical, yeah. that would not be in keeping. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, all, um, officers can answer, but, I mean, we would, in, in this, as, as sorry, as Luciana has said, we would prefer um, from design terms it to reference the original building, yeah. not um, not sort of the odd one that's been put in afterwards. I've got one more question, yep. totally separate issue. Um, so on the question of segregation and our planning policies, uh, as I understand it, our planning policies is that we don't have corridors, that we don't have separate cause if we can avoid it that we don't have separate entrances and separate lifts for certain parts of buildings because that's you know not unifying for a community um what why is that okay here um i can answer this um just in terms of the overall lift provision under the current regulations you need to provide a fire safety lift so because the building is around 18 meters or the top story is at that level that is required i do not believe that the, the existing lift at the site meets those current kind of requirements so that is why essentially there is a new core going up to the roof um, there would be a provision of or requirement sorry of two lifts if the building was 30 meters or more but it's not it's below that so anything kind of gla referable does require two lifts but this is not of a scale that warrants that do the planning advisor said that they would happily have an integrated lift, just extend the existing lift shaft, I think, is that right? Or the existing stairwells? Um, we are, we, we do have one of the staircases proposed to be extended. Um, for what purpose it would make sense for people to come up, I'm not sure, but it, it definitely means that the people are in the same building. Um, we need to do that um, for fire escapes. And as we were saying, from a buildability point of view, the idea would be that the whole of it, the, the scheme could be built and then almost mm -hmm. just knocking through at the last minute, the building is then joined with one of the staircases. So people from these flats can walk through the building and go in and out of the front door if they don't want to use the lift. And likewise, if somebody in the lower floors wanted to visit someone in the, on the top floors, they could go up the stairs and they could. could and so that's the, that's the front, um, that's front, front stairs. The front, there is, um, there is sort of bit that sticks out. Yeah. In the Art Deco sense. So that so, bit is um, expanded up. That so. seemed to be something that objectors were asking for. Mm -hmm. Can we just check? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, the planning statement says that that's only for fire access, our extension, the extension of our building. So I, I refute what you say that it promotes free um, integration between both buildings because it's purely for fire access as per your planning statement. So I, I don't agree with what you said. Okay. I think you're misleading us. 
is it open access to people? What, 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 do, what if your if your statement says it's fire access? What does that well, mean? Is well, it that it covers off that that policy, or is it that it's we, we have to write it? certain things in our planning statement to show that we're complying with regulations? So when we we wouldn't ordinarily describe a staircase as who is allowed to go up and down the staircase. We are discussing that now because there's obviously an issue that's come about about that. We've we've written about it because it's serving a purpose for fire escape. We, again, if there's a condition that says that door can swing both ways, we have no objection to that. The staircase physically connects the building. Um, the floors, people from the ground floor can visit people from the top floor, vice versa, and they can walk through. There's no intention to block it completely. It makes, okay. there's, no, there's no logic from our side for that. Fine. So, so say, that, I'm sorry right. if it's come across the wrong way. Uh, about Fine. being a fire so that, so that staircase style where stairwell that's been expanded, expanded up will be it won't be sort of um fire sort of push the bar and you can only get out one way it will be sort of both ways anyway and that's the same is that the same for the other floors basically um the other floors going down the yeah, building going down yeah, down they, so they can be accessed yeah. as, as normal they're not push bars okay do do we need to see that by condition or um is it just in the design? What's I your, think it's important to be clear that if the existing stairwell gets extended up, that the additional massing wouldn't, war wouldn't warrant planning permission separately. Um, I don't know the answer to that because I haven't got the lower ground or the lower floor plans in front of me. So essentially, if that, if that stairwell was extended up, which then extended the massing of the building, that in itself would require planning permission. And it's already in, it's already in the... It, it does extend. It's, it's in, yes, it's in right. the floor I don't plans. know. I've not got the plans in front of me, so I can't clarify Sorry. that for members at this time. Yeah. I was just trying to give the scenarios. It is incorporated within the floor plans as, as drawn. Okay. The staircase is there. It's only one of the two staircases, and it doesn't extend yeah. out. It's, it's within the envelope of the proposals. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the, it's, it's happening. It's the question is whether it will be in use as general to connect the rest of the building together, basically. So, I mean, if, if it's already there and it's all as we know, does it do we... Is it useful to have a condition to make sure that it's a sort of door that moves both ways so that it's in the entire building is one community or do we is that going too far in terms of conditions just in terms of relating it to the statutory test i mean you have to make a judgment as to whether you think it's necessary to make the development acceptable um i'm a bit kind of in on in the middle with that one if members think that that condition is necessary and the applicants have to go with it um, I don't think I've had any in principle objections. I don't know whether Christine might want to have a word. Yeah, I mean, Christine, given that we're concerned that we don't want a separate sort of access point for the new flats, we want to promote the entire building to be sort of one community where possible, is it? And that's within our policy where we don't have um, sort of different, you know, the different sort of poor doors and things like that. Is it relevant in this um, case? It can be considered relevant as part of determining this planning application, and if the applicant is willing to have such a condition, I think then you're happy. Feasible. Okay, I think the, uh, the applicant's already said that they're happy to do it. So can we add that in as a condition? Thank you, uh, Councillor Narcos. Um, just just on that same point, is can we also have a condition that the existing lift is extended, or is that stretched too far? Because it's still the sort of same principle. Because you know, you can argue that. Um, you know, someone who has to use a lift can't access, you know, that top floor in the same way somebody uses the stairs. Does the lift service every um, floor? The problem with extending the existing lift would be the location of where it would come up. And I guess it... it, it it's, it's, so it's, there's nothing being built above the lift. So looking at the tiles, the, the, the new lift and the new stairs can't service the well, existing the lift, the lift shaft is in a different position to the front though, isn't it? So the, the, new, the new bit can't service the existing flats because of where it is, um, you know, but the, the existing one, there's nothing being built over the top of the existing one to allow the, the existing stairs and the existing lifts to service the new, the new development on the top that I can see. And that would, that would apply to the principle that we just talked about, about making sure it's, you know, cohesively one building and it's not a kind of a demonous system of the, you know, the nice new flats, you know, get their own, own lift access. Councillor, just to advise, um, maybe as planning officer could uh, provide a bit more information. But if the exist, if the proposed plans don't show the extension of the existing list of staff, then that would form part of the new planning application to be considered. Sorry, does the lift currently serve the other floors? We don't have floor plans of the, but the 
lower floors, but my understanding is that the new stair and lift core extends up to the new fifth floor only, and it doesn't serve the existing floors. So, sorry, I'd clarify that one thing. So, so the existing lift that services the existing floors of the existing building, according to this plan of the proposed fifth floor extension, there is nothing being built over the top of that. So similarly, as the staircase of the existing building will give access to the fifth floor, my question is about whether that we can have a condition where that lift also has to give access to the fifth floor on, the, on that same principle that we want to create one building and not on a kind of a them and us system. Obviously, the new lift and the new staircase, the positioning of that from sorry, right? Okay, so you are you yeah, are disaggregating, so, but yeah. presumably they're putting in. Can you tell us why you're putting in a new lift? You're not extending the old lift. Is probably the question. So it was, <laughs> but it was twofold really. One is that when we're putting in a new lift to access it, the size of that lift needs to be. Um, bigger to comply with today's regulations and it needs to be a firefighting lift and those things we can't achieve in an existing lift shaft um, and that was the same for the stairs and then the second reason was about the disruption and as I said if, if you want to extend a lift shaft you're effectively ripping out that lift for a number of months while that gets a new lift installed and, and everything goes with that um, I'm not sure other than perhaps to tick a box of this kind of not having the segregation, which I feel we've kind of overcome with the stairs, it sort of just feels like a, a, an unnecessary expense and upheaval and disruption for everybody. Right, and then the new lift, the, the new lift that's going in only services the sixth floor. That's right, yes. Okay, and is, and I suppose why is that? Um, the layout of the existing building. So, it, it, because of the position, we, we've we've positioned it in the in a location where there's no windows, and so that it effectively doesn't disrupt any of the existing flats. Um, but also, if you was to knock through, you would only be knocking through to one flat on each floor. Not yeah. The so, you would, so you wouldn't be knocking through into a corridor. You'd be knocking through into people's yeah. flats. Yeah. If you expand, if you uh, on the basis of this lift, right? Sorry, yep. Um, just one more thing for members to consider. So if we did extend the existing lift shaft upwards, that in itself would create additional structure and massing on the roof, which is a form of development in itself, which is outside of the scope of what we're assessing tonight. So it would actually require a separate form of planning permission. So therefore, I don't think that we can like legally or lawfully have that as a condition, as, as, as a nice gesture as it is. Does that answer your questions? Does that sort of set it out a bit more? If if the committee felt really strongly about this, could we ask them to to bring it back with that? Is, is that so? I don't. Um, I think given what we've heard about, what I mean, you're not you're presumably not asking for the new lift to punch through into people's flats because that'd be ludicrous. So what no, you, no, it's, what it's you nothing would about the new lift. It's about the existing lift for for you know the reason we talked about the case yeah. of the building. I'm not sure that would be reasonable. Thank you, Chair. I think we have to remember, one, the applicant isn't here tonight, and so we have to think very carefully with regards to what sort of additional addition, conditions we'd like to, um, we would want. And at the end of the day, you've got to think this application here tonight is with regards to the fifth floor, with regards to the residential units, and therefore what you're asking for is something, is it relevant to determine in this application? I think that's the question we have to consider. Is, is it not yeah is it not relevant to our policies about not having sort of segregated access and i completely get your point about the applicant not being here but i think as as other members have said it's disappointing that the applicant's not here and you know they're, they're you know they haven't come to hear these objections they haven't come to hear our questions and our concerns and you know to what degree we have to factor that into you know our recommendations i'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure i think if we were basing it on just that one um area given that we've had a discussion about the stairwells and i don't think that would be given that we've sort of um, um, covered it off with the with the stairwell conversation, the condition there, I don't think it feels um, right to defer something that would have to be completely redesigned, basically. Um, so it would be it would be a case of um, you know, I don't think it, I don't think it's is right to defer on that basis, on that small basis alone. Um, it would be a case of you would have to take a view about whether that was enough in terms of planning balance to, I think, um, uh, vote against it rather than um, defer it, I think. A deferral, I think, for things to be sorted out, like if we had have not had answers on the roof terrace, things like that, and questions unanswered, um, I think it's fair to defer on that, fair to defer on that basis. But I think deferring on the basis that you want it redesigned, 
I think is probably not um, not reasonable. Um, so you have to take that into account in your decision at the end. Okay. Um, questions, otherwise, from the committee. Okay. Anyone? Um, we've covered off windows, which I had a couple of lift and stairwell. Um, just in terms of the air source heat pumps and the PV, is that are they um, uh, just for the new flats, or are they service the entire building? They're just for the new flats. Okay. Um, and why is that? What's the what's the reasoning for that? Um, I think, as we touched upon earlier, that the um, properties are all on different leaseholds. This is a new development, and we're providing the energy sources for, those, for those individual for flats. And okay. Great. Any other questions? Because um, otherwise, we can move to a vote. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Um, the recommendation uh, summary is to grant planning permission, subject to conditions, and complete uh, completion of a legal agreement that includes the new uh, conditions that we've um, established this evening. Okay. So, all those in favour, please raise your hands. Thank you. All those uh, against, please raise your hands. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Desmond, one. And then abstentions, uh, three. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for this evening. Um, we're moving on now to, so that passes, sorry. Um, yep. yep. Great. Um, we move on then to item eight. Do people want to take a five minute break? Um, members in particular. Members, five minute break, or continue on to item eight, which I think is a short one. No, although you never know. <laughs> Don't say that. Okay, let's continue then in that case. Um, we have um, speakers. Hello, Gareth. Um, Hello, Danny. Can we uh, vacate the room for everyone else? Okay, thank you. We'll vacate those um, seats. So we've got item eight, 108 Blurton Road. Um, we'll be led by Gareth. Um, could we get the lights down? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, oh, hang on, hang on. Can we just yeah. wait for the objectors yeah. to leave? Because I'm Councillor Rathbone, right. would you mind um, vacating those seats, please? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Right. Just, yeah. Just mind your, mind your, just mind your, mind your footing, so I know so people turn the lights off. I'm always worried, so I'm not sure about that. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, item eight, 108 Blurton Road. Um, good evening, members. Item eight seeks householder planning consent for the erection of a single story ground floor rear extension. Uh, this application is being presented to members of the subcommittees. The applicant is a council officer. Um, here you can see the site location plan with the site outlined in red. It lies on the southern side of Blurton Road to the east of Chatsworth Road. The site is neither listed nor lies within a conservation area. Um, here we have existing site photos showing the front elevation. It's a late Victorian property with a mansard roof extension. On the right hand side, you have an aerial view of the rear elevation of the site and the terrace. Um, the site is the one with the white rendered outrigger, which is I put an, a red arrow just depicting its location. Um, looking along the immediate terrace, you can see a number of properties have extended under permitted development three metres from the rear outrigger, which forms part of the local context. Um, looking at the wider terrace of uh, Blurton Road, this shows obviously the terrace in its totality. Um, of particular reference uh, to members is 98 Blurton Road, which I don't know whether I can show. Does, does my cursor come up? No, it doesn't. So in the centre of the terrace, you have a pretty much identical wraparound rear extension that was approved in 2016 uh, to this planning application. Um, as you can see all along the terrace, there's various forms of development in terms of rear extensions, in terms of obviously different heights, forms and massings. So the actual the context is very much varied. As you can see, it's residential in its context. Uh, moving to layouts, uh, the proposal seeks a single story ground floor wraparound extension. It will project 1.6 metres beyond the outrigger and the total depth will be approximately 8 metres. Uh, the extension will facilitate an enlarged living kitchen area to the dwelling house. It will include bifold doors to the rear and well over 50% of the garden area will be retained. 
Uh, this is an existing roof plan that basically, sorry, existing and proposed roof plan, which shows uh, the form of the roof, which is mono pitch and the provision of four roof lights. Uh, moving to elevations, the proposal will have a wraparound monopitch roof design, which complements the form and proportions of a late Victorian dwelling house. The material to match condition is proposed to ensure an aesthetic appearance is of high quality and relates to the existing property. Um, just in terms of amenity concerns, the development complies with a 45 degree ruling advocated in the SPD, the residential extensions, which is measured from the closest habitable window from the adjoining property, which I believe is 106 Burton Road. Uh, members should also note that um, the applicant could deliver an, an extension of a greater height. Uh, the mono pitch section which abuts the site curtilage is 2.5 metres. This has been amended from over three metres. Um, under Class A, the GPDO, you could deliver or implement, sorry, a three metre high extension on the boundary. So this is lesser in terms of its massing and what could be achieved under permitted development. Um, so in summary, the proposed development is, of the site is deemed acceptable. Its size, design, scale and location would not detract from the character and appearance of the site or the surrounding area. Um, officers consequently recommend planning permission is granted, subject to conditions outlined in the report. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. And just to reconfirm the reason we're hearing this at the committee is that it's a council officer's application, so it ultimately comes to us though he's not a planning and department officer. Um, good, sorry, that's right, yes, uh, yeah, great. Fantastic, okay, questions um, from, oh, sorry, no, hang on, sorry, we do have a, um, sorry, my fault. Uh, we do have a supporting um, person to speak. We have um, Nita Patel, who's joining remotely. You're a bit frozen, I think, but hopefully we can hear you. Yes, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you now. Um, it may be better. You, uh, it looks like you've got a bit of um, bandwidth issues. So it might, if you're able to turn your camera off, that might be a bit better if you're, if you're able to do that. Try again. OK, can you hear me okay uh, much, now? Much clearer, I think, yeah. So you've got up to five minutes, Nita, and I'll... I'll give you a one minute warning um, through the microphone. Um, uh, but as, whenever you're ready, you're welcome to start. So thank you. The Sorry, Nita. Today, sorry, sorry, Nita. I'll, I'll stop you. Consent. Sorry, Nita. I'll stop you there because we can't. We haven't heard a word that you've said. I'm afraid because the line is not good. One second. I think if we can establish, if we can't establish a clear line, then I'm afraid uh, Nita won't be able to be able to give us a mission. Um, unfortunately, she's not able to join us in the room. She is abroad. Uh, we've attempted. To, do, do, can we go on with the application though, or do we um, have to? Yeah, yeah, this is a uh, supporter, so it's not an no, objective. objective. So, um, okay. uh, Nita, if you try again, um, and then I'll let you know if we can hear you or not. Um, but we might have to move on without your um, verbal submission. Yeah, but that's fine. I want that to. No, I'm afraid not. I think, Chair, I think for just for the public record, we've tried to establish a link. Obviously, sometimes technology fails in us. Uh, Nita's attempted to do a submission, but unfortunately, we weren't able to establish a link. Okay, um, so Christine, you're happy for us to go ahead with this on the basis that um, uh, Nita is speaking in support anyway, so it doesn't um, undermine the um, ability of us to make a decision because we it would support the officer's recommendation, presumably. Agreed. Yeah, okay, uh, are members happy with that? Yeah, okay, great, okay, um, let's move to questions oh. then. Sorry, Nita, um, you're not coming through at all. I'm not sure whether you can hear me, but we'll we'll put you on silent when we move to move you to question uh, move to questions. Um, questions from the uh, committee. Any questions? I mean, the the on, only Councilor questions Young. would be the ones set out by the objector, really. Yeah, go ahead. Just have one. So, yes. 
Um, so well, you, can you can you see, you come and set it out? Come yeah, on. sorry. Okay, <laughs> I, I can't do as set out. <laughs> okay, cannot. so the objector makes five six points. Um, there is a response from the officer um, at three point five point three. Um, it, it's just really whether that. I mean, the first one is the extension significantly higher than the current fence, and so it might feel overbearing. Um, is it? much higher than anybody else's? Um, I can't answer whether it's higher than its existing fence because I've been asked to cover this application. I've not been on site. I can talk about the merits of the proposal, though. Um, as stated before, um, this application has been amended in terms of its overall size. This was the original submission which projected three metres beyond the outrigger. Um, it was also significantly higher. It was well over three metres in depth um, at the boundary. Um, as you can see here through the revisions, um, it's been changed to a monopitch design and it now only projects 1.6 metres beyond the outrigger, which matches um, the adjoining development to the west. Um, in terms of the overall height, it's 2.5 metres at the boundary, which meets the council's SPD residential extensions 45 degree ruling. I'd also make the point that the location of the massing, obviously you've got a two-storey outrigger that projects up to eight metres in the backdrop to that. So any additional massing which is in front of that, which is obviously significantly below the roof line, will not harbour any off or adverse amenity impacts. Particularly given that PD, um, you could do a extension under permitted event, which would be higher in essence. And so is there any, um, this, they go on to make another point about it being sort of overbearing and taking up a lot of the garden. Is there any um, issue around loss of green space in the garden? No, there's not. Um, so just in terms of the garden, we do have in our residential SPG, um, we generally don't permit extensions that take up more than 50% of the overall garden space of the, the property. Um, this development, even before it was amended, is significantly below that. Okay. And then the other, um, other sort of main area is about uh, the plans not showing where waste pipes, drainage, ventilation, etc. will be relocated. So, so the neighbour at 106 doesn't know how this might affect them. Yeah, as far as we know, that no, none of those elements are proposed as part of the submission. There is permitted development rights for, for pipes and things which people can do without planning permission, but the drawings do not indicate that any are needed. Um, obviously, the existing kitchen is on is under the outrigger, so I don't see any reason why you'd have pipes on the extended area, which is additional floor space, essentially. Okay, so they're not putting in a bathroom there? Um, the additional floor space is to extend the living kitchen area for the ground floor. Okay, that's, my question. that's all right. Fine. Any other questions from anyone? No, if people are happy, we can move to a vote. Okay, all those hang on. So, recommend um, grant planning uh, permission subject to conditions. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Great, that's yes. everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we've got item nine. Thank you, uh, Nita, for joining us. I'm sorry we couldn't hear you. Um, but it has passed if you can't um, see us. Um, you know, thank you. Great. Great, thank you. Um, item nine delegated decisions. So we've got um, delegated decisions to note um, from 13th of June and the 12th of July, and that's the resubmitted one that um, uh, was incorrect last time, and then 13th of July to 24th of August. Um, any comments? No, can, can members please note those? Um, thank you very much. Um, I have no AOB, and therefore that's the, other than the um, date of next meeting, 11th of October. Uh, for those of us at um, Labour Party Conference, that'd be a lovely way of um, coming back to, uh, coming back to London from, uh, from lovely, uh, yeah, I think it is, from lovely Liverpool. Um, otherwise, I think that's the end of the meeting, Gareth. Uh, just one, I just oh, wanted God. to mention very briefly, um, I mean, obviously, we'll finalise the detail. But you will notice uh, when you, if you've seen the pack, there is proposed planning pre-application meeting for Monday, the 13th of November. I think I'm looking over it, Natalie. I think we've still got to finalise some details. So, it's as far as I'm aware, it's still provisional. Okay. So we'll finalise it. But it's in your diary already. It's yeah. It's should, should well, yours. It's in the team. It's, it's in, in the meeting calendar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for a good meeting this night. Um, have a safe journey home. Great. Thank you to officers as well. Thank you to everyone online. Um, thanks. Oh.
Okay, Anwar, I'm not sure if you're there. If you could stop the live recording, please. Um, just to make everybody aware the light is still live recording, everybody. So, uh, um, sorry, everybody, it's still live recording. <laughs>